signal transduction pathway are identified, it may very well be that it's a combination that you end up having to use. So you'd have one drug affecting one pathway, you bring in another drug that has a little modifier effect. Again, in combination or it, separately, they wouldn't have quite as much effect as when they come together in combination. So we also like to do these preclinical uh, pre assessments. So as you start a trial, so a goal of, of some trials are preclinical trials, and that's where recognizing biology, screening compounds and animal models, where now that is starting to, to take off as well. So we're poised, I would say we're poised now to, to move forward. This is a key one that I, I think Bruce talked a little bit about, and that's the development of protocols, which takes a substantial amount of uh, effort from a lot of team members. And you have to think about the biologic plausibility. You don't want to just grab something off the shelf. I mean, there's a fair amount of expense that goes into trials, and you really want to have a pretty good sense that it works. And even in the mouse trials, so the selection of, of a drug, an agent that you would use, on animal models, you really want to have a pretty good sense that this is going to be effective. You have to wonder about the safety issues, so you'd like to use medications that might have already been used, have already gone through phase one trials, even if it's not been individuals for NF1. You want to make sure that they're safe for, for people before you jump, um, jump into, the, um, into the protocol development. So you have to think about inclusion exclusion criteria. Those of you who have participated in clinical trials, you may realize that sometimes it just doesn't work out for yourself or for your child. It just, you, you have to have very stringent criteria of who goes in because you don't want to compare apples and oranges. The definition of endpoints is really critical. And so for one trial, it may just be a volumetric increase in a, in a plexiform neurofibroma or showing that it doesn't progress in volume, whereas the background might be that there you see a, a steady increase in a tumor. If you're just showing that it gets flat, well, that's an endpoint. Even though the tumor doesn't shrink, that still shows that there's some effectiveness for that particular agent. Estimating appropriate sample size is a key thing, and that's why the statisticians become incredibly important as you develop these protocols. You would like to treat the fewest individuals so you get the answer in the shortest amount of time with exposing the um, too many individuals that, uh, well, if you don't need to. So you try to define what do you think the measured or what are you expecting the change to be, and then you define your protocol and you may come up with, let's say, 35 individuals is all you need. As you're recruiting, some of you may say, well, I understood that there was a, um, a clinical trial that was open, but now it's closed. And the reason it's closed is they may have achieved, even though they're still gathering data on those individuals, they've hit that, that um, end, or hit the um, sample size that they're, that they're um, really shooting for. And then finally, the human subject protection. And usually there's a data safety monitoring board that oversees this. And that's an, an objective group of individuals who are not tied in with the protocol itself and can step back. And as they review the data, they may say, either it's not effective, we're not seeing any kind of, of uh, effectiveness, or maybe it's not safe and stop the study. So it's very important. So all these things are going to how are you going to develop this protocol. So human subjects, these are, I just sort of off the top of my head, I went through our usual um, consent forms. And those of you who have signed consent forms, you might have seen that if you had started a clinical trial 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the consent forms were relatively short. And sometimes it was just verbal consent. And, if you just sat down and you're with uh, whoever was conducting the trial and said, yes, okay, I'm, I'm okay with this. Well, that's not good enough anymore. It takes a, a signed consent. You get a copy to take home with you. But the, the review boards, the institutional review boards, they go through a whole set of uh, criteria as they review these protocols. Benefits, of course, is top of the list. Benefit risk, especially for children, uh, you really have to consider that. You have to wonder about, is somebody capable of signing consent? So you have to know, do they need a legal guardian in order to, to sign off? Alternative treatments are, I find, really important. 
When you go in for a clinical trial, you really want to know what are your options. And sometimes there are no options. It makes it pretty straightforward. But there are times where you could, uh, clearly you could sit back and watch. You could do repetitive MRIs to, to try to gauge how fast a tumor may be growing. And that's not, uh, you know, I go back maybe to Abraham Lincoln. He said at one time, um, waiting can be a very active process. And I think what he was waiting for were these generals who were just sitting on their hands and, you know, the Civil War could have been over in a year and a half, so they thought. Um, and in fact, it really stretched out to about four years because the Union um, generals couldn't uh, make up their mind when to, uh, when to attack. So sample acquisition, a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these protocols, there'll be tumors that are taken off and you want to make sure that the biospecimens get to the right place. So um, you have to make sure that individuals agree that that specimen can be used in the way that um, it's specified. And what do you do with it afterwards? Do you want it to be used until it's all used up or do you only want it used for that particular study and then be discarded? So there's some options that people have. This has been one of the more tricky ones, is the research-related cost versus standard of care. And I think um, you'll see that, that we, we sometimes struggle with this in the consent forms because there are certain things that once you're placed on a protocol, it now becomes relatively expensive. And those of you who had been getting MRI scans perhaps every six months instead of every three months, well, somebody's paying for that extra residual 20%. Uh, uh, um, you know, if, it depends on what your co-pays are with different insurance companies. But somebody's paying that extra expense, and it's not usually coming out of the research dollars because it's considered standard of care once you're on a protocol. But the institutions now are looking at that very carefully, and uh, it is something to consider. There's always a thought of withdrawal. You can withdraw any time. Um, subjects can withdraw any time. Sometimes the, um, the people who are driving the protocol can just shut it down and say, okay, we're stopping the trial, and, and so they can withdraw. And then, of course, one of the big issues is liability. If something were to happen during a clinical trial, is insurance going to cover it? Is the institution going to cover it? Who's going to cover any additional medical costs that may arise with the clinical trial? So a lot of things that you may not have thought about, and, and this is what the Institutional Review Board is set up for, to review that so that you don't have to. So recruitment and enrollment is really a tricky thing. At least I find that it's a tricky thing. Um, those of you who sit at home and you get those phone calls from uh, um, folks asking for donations, let's say, um, that's a cold call, and you may not appreciate that so much. And, and I think we all recognize that maybe you don't appreciate that for, for um, protocol for clinical trials as well. So we try to make sure the information is out there, but it's up to the subjects or the families to make that first call to tie in. And that's, that can sometimes be tricky because certainly there, there should be no sense of coercion to join in any kind of clinical trial. So in the recruitment process, you want to know what the, the criteria are for inclusion and exclusion. There's oftentimes pretreatment studies that need to be pulled together, um, and that may be what determines whether you're eligible or not. Travel issues are huge, especially out west. You know, for those who drive into Las Vegas, you know, it's, it's a pretty big deal, and especially if there's something that needs to be evaluated. Um, let's say just a, a side effect that may be cold sores that may come up with a certain protocol that needs to be evaluated. And if you don't have an, uh, an academic center nearby, it's a, it's a big deal for families to end up um, traveling. We have to wonder about the compensation versus enticement. We try to make sure that the, if there's compensation that it's at the level that would be expected for the amount of effort that people put in. And we all realize that Families take a lot of time off work. Um, they have to drive. It's the, um, the additional expenses that go along with this that cannot be, oftentimes cannot be covered by the, the protocols themselves because of this concern for enticement that people would um, not otherwise participate unless they got some form of compensation. 